when you are. It says recording, so I'll take that as a good sign. Yes. All right. All right, let's get this Zoom chat, recruiting chat started. I'm Bob Founders of Penn Live, joined by Greg Pickle, as always, at Penn Live, and our special guest this week, Ryan Snyder, BWI and Rivals, kills it on the recruiting trail, also a mid state guy, so props to that. Central Gotham, correct? Correct, yep. So, so there's definitely a mid state flavor to this one. We had Mark Brennan on the, uh, on the, on the uh, Zoom chat last week. He's a state college guy, he's from Northeast PA. I think she's a little bit of a cook. I don't know if that's actually accurate, but I haven't gotten any food from him. So Ryan, uh, welcome, to the Zoom, welcome to the Zoom chat. We're just gonna kind of deal mostly with recruiting. Greg's been banning my ear all spring about Penn State's recruiting class. Um, as we talk about this now, around lunchtime on Tuesday, uh, how do you, what's your read on Penn State's class? They don't have, it's not gonna be a particularly big class because they're a little, I think they're a little bit stacked uh, with current players they, they can't really go I think 25 deep this year but what's what's your read on the class this year and who are some of your favorite players that maybe not maybe not be um, at the top of the pecking order right now in terms of rankings mm -hmm. well I think you know right now if if no one transfers out which will happen I think of course with time uh, the class would probably be maybe around 1920 which is pretty small we'll see a couple guys move uh, which will probably get it up to maybe 2021. 20, and that's kind of the, the ballpark uh, mindset, I guess you'd say, of what we have right now. So I think important positions left are defensive end. Uh, they, they took care of defensive back pretty well, and there's still a few guys that they'd like to add. But the defensive end is clearly the main spot. Getting a top quarterback, Christian Bayou, I think fans understand that situation pretty well by now. Um, and really just kind of moving forward, keeping the momentum going uh we'll, we'll see here what happens in may it's a couple guys to keep an eye on i think lonnie white uh, out of the philly area someone to watch he got an offer a couple weeks ago i think christian Veyu is someone to watch too um you know but but for the most part I, I think now they're in a pretty good spot i think fans were worried originally you know they always just want to see you know that their class being a good spot and it got off to a bit of a slow start, but but we knew they were in good shape with a lot of guys, and uh, you know fans have kind of seen that play out over the weeks. As far as your second question, I think Jeffrey Davis Jr. gets uh, a lot of questions about um, you know what, why did Penn State take him when there's a lot of other good you know defensive backs available. It really comes down to this: he camped with them twice. He ran a four-five, um, you know, good shuttle times. He was around a four-two. He's just been consistent, and when you get guys in camp especially during this whole situation where, you know, you're not getting reliable numbers, you can't get them back to camp this year. They know what they're getting there. So just a consistent player, a versatile player, uh, and, and someone that, again, they, they know what they're getting. So I, I, I like him, and I think he's kind of someone that fans, uh, you know, question a bit. And I think in a couple of years you'll understand why he wasn't taken. Greg, what's, who's the most underrated prospect in the class to date? I'll go, I like what Ryan said about Jeffrey Davis Jr. I think a lot of people look at him and thought that same thing. Why did Penn State take him? I think Kobe King was another one where folks were like, what, did they only take him for his brother? Or was it a package deal? And that was the only reason they took him because they took Kalen King. And to me, and Ryan, I know you've written about this as well. This is a guy that is a true, uh, true linebacker and a really good sound talent. And I think he'd be a take on his own, even if it wasn't for his brother. And I think that some look at it and say, well, maybe he's only a three star. Maybe he doesn't have the highest uh, rating among linebackers regionally, nationally, what have you, and say, you know what? They shouldn't have, uh, you know, used a spot in a maybe a little bit of a smaller class on this kid. And I think that just uh, – it maybe isn't the right way to look at it. Ryan, when you were assessing Penn State's recruiting, uh, the challenges they would face during all this before the dead period was extended to April 30, then again to May, uh, the end of May, you know, what was maybe one or two of the issues you thought they'd struggle with that really hasn't turned out to be the case? Well, I think visits are always so important, right? Uh, and one thing that kind of stunk with the way the schedule worked out for Penn State was that their last big event was February 1. And then Penn State went on spring break a little earlier than some schools. So they didn't get in in early uh, March visits. Uh, and you saw some schools do that. So we thought that could come back to hurt them with some players. And it still might. We'll kind of see what happens. But what we're also learning is that 
because there is no spring practice, because coaches are stuck at home, recruiting has not stopped. If anything, it is busier than ever. Um, I think a lot of fans watching this will know Nolan Rucci pretty well. You know, his family kind of shut it down for a week. I think that was two weeks ago now. Uh, because of how <laughs> many calls, you know, how many texts, how just consistent everything was. And a lot of players are saying that. I talked to Jamari Budden, a linebacker out of Michigan, just yesterday. And he was saying that, uh, you know, every school contacts him. He, he, he knocked his schools down the seven. Every one of those schools contacts him every single day. So imagine seven coaches, or excuse me, seven coaching staffs, multiple coaches on each staff. We know Penn State will take their whole defensive staff, which has worked in a lot of ways because, you know, they get to know every coach. And, and you know, just reaching out at different times of the day. So it has been a lot, uh, you know, a lot of uh, pressure, I guess you would say, to get back to all these coaches, to, to keep up with everything. And uh, I think that has forced some kids to make commitments that maybe on the back end when the visits are allowed, we'll see them uh, open things up a bit. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. Oh, Bob, I'll just jump back in real quick. Just go ahead, Greg. Go right ahead. We've heard James Franklin so often talk about trying to talk kids out of committing and making sure that they have every reason, every box checked to commit before they do so. And I think one concern or at least curiosity that I've had that you just brought up there is our guys going to commit just because they're bored or just because everybody else is doing it and getting attention on social media and they're finding out that, you know, maybe spots are filling up faster. So I think that's where you get into some of these conversations too about guys like Kobe King, Jeffrey Davis Jr. fairly or unfairly, but what is your read on that? Has Penn State had to really pump the brakes on some guys? Have they had to really reemphasize that whole idea of what commitment means? What have you sort of uh, learned over the last couple of weeks and months, I guess, about that? Well, for Penn State, they only had three commitments kind of going into all this, you know, when you, when you add in Tengwall. So they haven't had to have too many guys. Um, there were, I guess, maybe probably a few, um, which is more message board talk than anything that, you know, they maybe have pumped the brakes on over time. But for the most part, that hasn't impacted, at least publicly from what we know, um, with too many guys. But, uh, yeah, there are a lot of players who I think have kind of rushed this a bit. Uh, guys who, you know, in maybe the beginning of March, late February, were always talking about official visits. And then all of a sudden, here in the beginning of April, even into the middle of the month, they've kind of just made snap commitments. Uh, we always see decommitments at the end of seasons, and, and you know, guys want to take those official visits in December. What we may see this year will be very interesting. Maybe, maybe you know, uh, things will change, and, and you know, we'll see visits in July or whatnot. But I get the feeling that we may not see visits until the fall, and and who even knows what will happen with the football season. And if that's the case. And, and, you know, maybe sometime at the end of the year where they will be visits. It's, it's going to be hectic for you, Greg. It's going to be very hectic, yes. <laughs> to say the least. So we'll see what happens. All right, guys. Two, a two-part question. Uh, I get this from fans a lot. Uh, is dominating the state overblown now that James is in his seventh year and they have expanded their national footprint? They're going into the South. Is that overblown? And also, is Nolan Rucci, if they would get, if they would get Rucci, would he be the best offensive line recruit uh, uh, of the James Franklin era in terms of talent? Because they've had some good offensive linemen come to Penn State already. Uh, I'll take Rucci real quick, Greg. Uh, I think Rasheed Walker, as fans are going to see here, maybe in a couple, maybe a couple months, by the end of the year, I think he's a real prospect that could leave and go to the NFL draft and be a very, uh, you know, a high pick, a first round pick. I really do believe that. So I think, you know, if you look at rankings and whatnot, yes, he's one of the one of the top guys. And I think, you know, the the, the world of him, I, I think his head's on straight. I, I, everything about Rucci projects to be someone who could be a, an excellent player. But I also think if you go back over the years, Caden Wallace is another guy who, again, he may not be as highly ranked as, as what Rucci and even Tangwell had. But we're going to see, you know, why these guys were so coveted. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what's up with time. I think Rucci – I think Rucci's going to take his time for just to talk about recruitment quick. I think he's going to take his time with this. He really wants to take other visits, and it's a smart thing to do. Uh, like I said, he's mature beyond his years, and, and I think that's why he's so coveted by so many schools. But, uh, he, yeah, I, I, um, I, I think the world of that kid, actually, and I, I really actually – I think – I understand why Penn State fans are so excited about him because he's a legacy prospect, and uh, he, he could be very highly uh, 
you know, go on to do big things. Let me run this by you on the dominate the state idea. Obviously, you don't want to lose Julian Fleming. You don't want to lose potentially Nolan Rucci, not saying Penn State will, just saying that it's a possibility. He obviously has other teams that he wants to check out when visits are allowed and things like that. But to Bob's point, when James Franklin got here, uh, dominating the state was crucial because they didn't have a national footprint. Now they do. So I don't think it's as soul crushing at this point when you lose a guy like a Kyle McCord or a Marvin Harrison to Ohio State, especially guys from an area where maybe they aren't as uh, likely to go to Penn State as guys in some other areas of the state. So, you know, it's always going to be a catchphrase that sticks with James Franklin, Ryan. I'm just not as convinced it's as dire now uh, as we've seen Terry Smith get into Texas and Jaywon Sider get into Florida and Tim Banks get into the Midwest. It just isn't, I don't think, as, as much of a – as much of a focus as it you know it's always going to be a focus to get PA's top players but I just don't know if it's as dire as it maybe we've seen back in 2014. Yeah I, I you hit it on everything there I don't really have much to add to it they're they're in a good spot they want to be an elite spot uh, I think they got to get the, the wins on the field you know I think fans understand that um, you know you got to got to get over that get over that hump but everything else is there uh, for them to be a national uh, not powerhouse, but, you know, at least one of the, the elite players. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Guys, can we just talk a little bit, and Penn State fans might get mad at me, can we just talk a little bit about <clears throat> what James uh, and his staff are up against uh, with what Ohio State's been able to do the last couple of years, not only in terms of uh, landing five-star kids but also uh what they've been able to do via the transfer portal and that's almost like an extension really of recruiting now as well how how how, what's the so how big is the gap do you think in recruiting between ohio state and penn state and also how, how how much has james closed the gap because i think that he's definitely adding some elite talent and you know they they're a handful of plays the last couple of years uh, from beating Ohio State the last couple of games, maybe not the last game so much, but 2017 and 2018. Just what Ohio State's doing and how can Penn, can Penn State maybe just just kind of counteract that even a little bit because they've been they were just adding an unbelievable amount of athletes. I'll handle it. Um, so I think someone who works you know, for, for rivals and, and, you know, all these, all these recruiting sites, we, we look at numbers all the time and we say, this guy's 35th and Penn State's getting guys who are 250th. And I think sometimes we put a little too much stock into that. Uh, is Ohio State on a different level right now? Yes. And, and they have put together elite recruiting classes and that has put them in a good spot. At the same time, we just saw Penn State Take them to the wire a couple, not this year, but in the last couple of years. And they did, you know, win a couple of years before that. So I don't think the gap is as big as some fans will make it out to be, especially, you know, when we're seeing the NFL draft and, and you know, the numbers that Ohio State's cranking out. Again, it's just about finishing it to me. They, I think they have the athletes to do it. I, we, we saw it up close, but it's also putting those classes consistently together. Will this year's class be, be up there with Ohio State? Probably not. They, this Ohio State class is maybe one of the best that we've ever seen with them, uh, at least, you know, as of, as of the end of April. But for the most part, we, we see Penn State putting together, uh, you know, top classes, at least in my opinion. Again, I, I think sometimes we look at 250, 180, and, you know, other guys that are top 50. I think we put just too much stock into that sometimes. And, they have the players to do it. They just got to do it. The NFL draft, Ryan, is always the great debate about two stars, three stars, four stars, and five stars. As someone who's obviously been in that industry for a long time and kind of playing off of the point you just made that maybe there is too much stock put into that stuff from time to time, what is your message to people who try and use that solely as the way to, uh, you know, judge a class, especially in a year like this where you guys, if I'm not mistaken, have had to either postpone or cancel your combines and the yeah. Rivals Five Star Challenge. And, you know, this year in particular, I think could be one of the more challenging ones, not just, of course, for schools, but for the evaluators as well, because a lot of these events where you used to be able to get out and see guys just aren't probably going to happen. Well, this is a major issue right now. Um, not even so much for us, more so for the schools. It's a much bigger issue for the sure, schools. Right. Right now. Uh, you know, rankings change off the camps, and, but we've seen enough. And, again, I think, I think the best way to describe it is 
the coaches need so much more information than sites like Rivals and 247. We, we, we get guys in ballparks and we, we, you know, we get numbers and we try to do our best organizing them. To, to a school like Penn State, it can be the difference between, you know, a, a national championship and uh, an Outback Bowl. So, you know, they really need to hit on these guys. And that's why camps, not having camps this year is a major, major issue, I think. And not even just for 2021, but for 2022. I mean, how many guys have we seen? Jeffrey Davis Jr., for example, great example. Came to camp the last couple of years, put consistent numbers in, multiple camps, by the way, not just one, but came multiple times. And that's the difference between him going to a school like Penn State over, you know, um, you know, Rutgers or Boston College, he said, were the two schools recruiting him the hardest at the end. So I think it's a major issue for those, uh, for, for the schools more so than the sites. But it is to some degree for the sites too. Again, you know, the combines are important. The camps are important. It's the one time of the year where we get elite prospects from all of New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, all in one place. But at the same time, you only want to put so much stock in that stuff. So it's, it's really – you know, the, the, the schools that are, been, are hurt by this the most. Hey, uh, can I ask you guys a question about Penn State's group? This is technically still recruiting. So you guys, I'm going to hold you to this. You guys already mentioned you guys like Caden Wallace. And I think a lot of people are expecting big things from him. If not this year, maybe, maybe down the line. Penn, Penn State's got some tackles who might be moving on fairly quickly. Um, who is your favorite redshirt freshman to watch moving forward not named Caden Wallace in this group and why do you like him so much go ahead Greg well I think obviously when you look at the receiver pitcher all of us have been thinking that that position group is going to be the one that has the biggest question marks and the most approved with Taylor Stubblefield in and KJ Handler out TJ Jones topping the spring depth chart which look we all know what that was it was not by any means it was not a hard fast um, you know, set in stone thing. It was more about something to talk about amid all this than anything else. But the fact that he found his way there tells me that while John Dunmore maybe got more of the hype and more of the offseason praise and things like that from those, um, you know, that were following along with what the coaches were saying and the other players were saying, et cetera, it seems like TJ Jones is the name not to forget about. I think we all can agree one of those two Florida receivers will have a big role for Penn State in 2020 and certainly beyond. But yeah, TJ Jones is that guy for me. All right, I'll go with Dunmore. You know why? Because I, I, I've, through those camps and through the combine and whatnot that we've had, I don't know if I've ever seen a better route runner up close and personal than John Dunmore. I think he needs to still maybe grasp the playbook more, uh, get maybe weightlifting-wise. I think that's maybe kind of a bit of an issue, but everything is there. I mean, there's a reason he was so coveted, and again, it's it's a major position in need. So, uh, like Subblefield said, I wouldn't put a whole lot, a lot of stock into that depth chart. And I do believe that John Dunmore, uh, I'm not going to compare him to a, a Henry Ruggs or any of those elite guys that just got drafted. <clears throat> but I think he can be uh, a big-time player. I really still am uh, firmly in that boat. Just no love. No love for Lance Dixon. What's he got to do? What's he got to do, guys? He's only like – I think he might be faster than both those wideouts right now. But I like the Dunmore pick, too. Greg knows I've been a big – uh, Dunmore fan. Okay, uh, Greg, I know you, you want to wrap this up, but I just want to I want to thank Ryan Snyder of uh, of Blue White Illustrated and and Rivals. I'm Bob Flounders. Greg Pickles on on the Zoom chat as well. Before we uh, before we wrap it up though, uh, I have a I have a true or false question for Ryan. Ryan, will the eventual Kentucky Derby champion be running this Saturday at Oaklawn Park? Is true or false? Um. I don't know. You guys are the horse racing experts, not me. Uh, I'll say tr true. You say true, you got to say, you got to name the horse. I don't know. You guys are the experts, not me. Greg, I, I, true, true, Greg, Greg, true or false? False. You guys are, well, he's, he's mostly right. Charlatan's running Saturday at Oaklawn Park. He will win the Kentucky Derby on September 5th. Take it to the bank. Uh, Greg, do you, any other recruiting stuff to get to before we uh, we get out of this uh, this Zoom chat? Ryan, one last one for you. Just in the idea of uncertainty, we don't know when visits will be allowed again. We don't know when uh, uh, campuses will open back up. In your mind, is that going to impact the number of guys who sign in December? We've seen that obviously become, as James Franklin has said, the new signing day. You think that's going to change this year with everything that's going on? Well, first off, if you guys want to talk sports betting, we can talk sports betting. <laughs> 
don't, I don't know horses, but I know everything else. Um, do I think it will impact that number? Well, we, that number's been pretty big uh, over, the, over the past couple years. Uh, I don't have the exact number, but I think it's you know, somewhere up to like 70%. So will it impact it? Man, maybe a little bit, but I, I, I think now that we've had a couple years with that system, guys have, okay, let's, let's remember one thing right now. Guys are getting pounded, 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 pounded with calls, mail, text, everything. That has, you know, been the case for six weeks now, and it may continue for another five, six weeks. Who knows? That's what happens when you don't sign in December and you wait through January. You get pounded with coaches. And then, by the way, not only do they call, text, all that, but they're at your house every single night. I, I think when you go through this whole process and guys understand of, you know, through seeing this over the last couple of years, what comes from that, um, they're, they're not going to want to do that. So I still think we'll see a good chunk of, of the class, maybe 60, 70, 80 percent, um, which is a wide range there I just gave. We'll say 70, 80 uh, percent. We'll sign in December. But I think before we get there, especially if there is a season, uh, November and December are going to be pretty crazy. Greg, you're supposed to wrap it up now. Oh, was that supposed to be it? All right, Bob. Good. I will do that. <laughs> Ryan Snyder from Blue White Illustrated. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll be looking forward to your picks whenever sports start again. Yes. Bob, thank you. We will talk soon, I'm sure. And until next time, this has been another edition of Penn Live's Penn State Beat Zoom interview sessions. Uh, see you next time. Take care. Thanks, Ryan. Happy back.